remember in my debut stream when I said I'd try to do a history stream every two weeks? Ah. ah, well, we're here now. That's what matters. All right. <clears throat> um, audio's looking decent. So let's hop right in. We got a lot of ground to cover. Away, Amaki! My name is Faustus Marius Incatatus, the true consul of Rome, the favorite horse of the god Emperor Caligula. Hope you are all having a fantastic evening, a good start to your weekend. I'm happy to be here, happy to, as I said, be sharing this uh, history presentation with you, this long, long, long overdue history presentation. What can I say? Sometimes these, uh, these things do take time. I've uh, started a new job in the uh, time since I did the last one, so gonna blame that just a little bit mostly uh mostly you can blame the dumb horse blame the dumb horse because he is deserving of that blame but yes finally getting to do another horse tree presentation so so excited for this one because we're going to south america you don't see that very often south america very often overlooked uh in history and uh well there are some really fascinating stories there so I feel like it's a it's an underappreciated historical market, if you will. So uh, I'm excited to bring uh, kind of one of the craziest stories in the history of South America to you guys tonight. So uh, so yeah, um, I have nothing else really to announce before we hop in. I'll uh, I'll try and get a schedule for this weekend published. Maybe I don't know. I'm gonna play spooky games on uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Probably gonna take Monday off though. Um, just because I will be doing things for Halloween, but I hope you have a good one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that is about it for the announcements. So, shoot, man. Let's go ahead and get this started. Oh, man, I'm excited. <laughs> Alright, here we go, here we go. Yes. Alright. So, today's presentation is called Vencer o Morir, The War of the Triple Alliance. Vencer o Morir is the uh, personal slogan of one of the, uh, well, you could probably consider him the antagonist of the, of the War of the Triple Alliance. It means to conquer or to die. And uh, as you'll see, uh, he definitely lived up to his personal slogan. So... We're going to hop right into the presentation. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please do use that chat feature. I'd love to hear from you. That's the whole point of doing these things live, is so that uh, I can clarify things on the fly if something is unclear or uh, you want more detail on something. So yeah, without further ado, let's hop right the hell on in. Okay, so... The War of the Triple Alliance, also known as the Paraguayan War, it's fought from 1864 to 1870 and involves the tiny nation of Paraguay, right there in the middle, against the Triple Alliance of Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. So you can kind of see where everything is on the map. So Paraguay fighting against pretty much all of its neighbors, well, both of its neighbors. Uh, Bolivia stays neutral, but uh, yeah, fighting against two much larger neighbors, and Uruguay is thrown into the mix as well. Seems like an absolute mix mismatch, but Paraguay manages to drag this sucker out for six whole years. And it does so using some pretty crazy methods, so... The War of the Triple Alliance is definitely the most significant war since the South American Wars of Independence, and probably the most significant war fought in South America up to the present day. It, in a lot of ways, marked the transition into the modern age for pretty much all of South America. It started out, uh, like most South American wars previously, with just small columns of men kind of hunting each other through the jungles and using, uh, using some outdated weapons. There were a lot of flintlock muskets and smoothbore bronze cannons deployed at the beginning. By the end, though, every army, except for Paraguay's, 
because they were kind of getting shellacked a little bit. But every army going after Paraguay had modernized to a great extent. They had the latest percussion cap, uh, muzzle-loading rifles. They had the rifled artillery. They were employing modern tactics. They were marching huge numbers of men into the battlefields. This, uh, this war seized the largest battle ever fought in South America. Not in, not in the 20th century, it's fought in the 19th century. So it really goes to show you how big this war was, how much it meant to, to pretty much everyone involved into the entire continent. So this is a very key moment in South American history, and it really goes to show how underappreciated South America is in a, in a historical sense that not a lot of people can probably tell you too much about it other than maybe just that Paraguay went a little crazy and fought all of its neighbors. So we're going to get into a lot of why that happened and how it happened in this presentation. So I hope you enjoy. So before we go into the war, I definitely want to establish some context for the uh, strategic situation. So we're going to go into a little bit of history about all of the participants, starting with the glorious empire of Brazil. <laughs> so in 1822, Brazil declared independence from Portugal under the rule of Pedro, who was actually the king of Portugal's son. But uh, rather than wait in line to rule over Portugal, he decided he wanted his own country, wanted to be free of his father. And uh, the, uh, colonists in the colonists in Brazil were, of course, uh, very supportive of that. There was a lot of desire for independence, especially after all of the Spanish colonies broke away. Uh, they were pretty much surrounded by free nations now, and they were still a colony. So there was definitely a ton of support for uh, breaking off and becoming an independent nation. And so they succeed in 1822, and Pedro becomes the first emperor of Brazil. Um, and he rules pretty well. Um... At the beginning, they immediately start fighting Argentina, which was their biggest neighbor for control of, uh, of a lot of their neighbors, of their borders. But most importantly, they fight them for control of Uruguay, which was, during the colonial era, kind of uns... It was an unsettled border. Uh, there was a lot of... There was some disagreement about who controlled Uruguay between Spain and uh, Portugal, but... Uh, Generally, the Spanish and the Portuguese didn't really consider it going to war for. Now that there was no concern about uh, Spain fighting Portugal, if uh, this colonial dispute flared up into a war, Brazil immediately goes after Argentina, and they both fight each other for control of Uruguay, but neither of them managed to make a whole lot of progress. The war ends in a stalemate, and they end up compromising. They end up having Uruguay be its own independent country, so that neither of them can control it. It's basically if I can't have it, then you can't have it either. But of course, both Argentina and Brazil both meddle extensively in tiny Uruguay's affairs, um, and that will lead to some serious conflict down the road. But uh, but yes, so pretty much immediately after becoming independent, Pedro I declares war on Argentina. They stalemate fighting over Uruguay. Uh, after that, things kind of get a little dicey. Internal divisions really arise, and uh, Brazil fights the Ragamuffin War from 1835 to 1845. And that was fought in the very southernmost province. This is going to be relevant uh, for the war that's uh, fought with Paraguay as well of Rio Grande do Sul, and it was fought because the farmers there were kind of pissed off about Brazil not enacting protectionist policies. They were sort of getting undercut on the market by, uh, by competitors from Argentina and Paraguay and uh, other places in South America. Their crops weren't competitive on the market, and uh, well, the, uh, the bureaucrats in the capital weren't really doing anything about it. So. so they have a big war of independence, try to separate from Brazil. It lasts for ten whole years. Uh, back and forth, but uh, eventually Brazil manages to uh, bring the ragamuffins, as they were called, to heel and uh, reincorporates Rio Grande do Sul as a, as a province. So by 1852, things have started to turn around for Brazil. They've uh, kind of got their house in order a little bit, and they fight another big war with Argentina. And this is, uh, this is fought in Uruguay as well. Um, but they fight Argentina basically for the control of the La Plata region, which is, well, the region that Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and southern Brazil all sort of occupy. 
And so they fight each other, they beat Argentina decisively. They depose Argentina's previous dictator, one, uh, Juan Manuel de Rosas, I think it's Juan Manuel, but definitely de Rosas, and they place their own guy on the throne of Argentina. They install a puppet uh, governor, but he's not really a puppet governor. He's still very much, uh, still very much independent from Brazil, but he's their guy. Like, they uh, place a more uh, friendly... We'll go a regime change. We'll call it a regime change there. So they affect regime change in Argentina. And uh, this really sets up Brazil as the leading regional power. They've defeated Argentina. They've affected regime change in their main rival. They hold a lot of sway over Uruguay from that time forward. And uh, they are pretty much the hegemon of South America at the time. So this is the situation that, uh, that Brazil finds itself in. It's very much interested in maintaining the status quo. It wants to maintain its role as the leading power in South America. It's very, very suspicious of anyone who's trying to upset that, be that Argentina or someone else like, say, Paraguay. So that is the situation that Brazil finds itself in. So let's talk now about the uh, their eternal rival, the uh, country that they beat in the Platine War. Let's go to Argentina. So before Argentina becomes Argentina, it's known for the most part as the Viceroyalty of La Plata. It's a Spanish colony, and in 1810 it starts to agitate for independence and finally breaks free from Spain in 1816. Most of the Viceroyalty of La Plata becomes Argentina, but parts of it do not, and that leads to some division afterwards, say in Uruguay and also in Paraguay. So, from the start, Argentina's kind of racked by political divisions. There are two main factions that are competing for control of Argentina. They're known as the Unitarios and the Federales. Now, the Unitarios are the urban class. They're mostly merchants. They represent the commercial interests of Argentina, and they are very much concentrated in Argentina's only major city, Buenos Aires. So, the, Unita the Unitarios... They advocate for a very strong central government in Argentina, and they kind of want to centralize the whole country around Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is basically all that matters in Argentina to these people. So, and they tend to support more. Uh, they tend to support more classically liberal policies. We could say they're uh, probably closer to say the American or the uh, United States view on things of politics they believe in uh, they believe in suffrage and they're kind of against slavery for the most part and that sort of thing so classically liberal the unitarios uh, the federales are representing the rural interests of Argentina so pretty much everyone except for Buenos Aires uh, sides with the federales they believe in a stronger in a sorry a weaker less centralized government uh, obviously because that makes more sense for them as a uh, rural people and uh, they tend to be more conservative in the sense of uh, in the latin america sense of conservative and that's basically just maintaining the hierarchy of society the privileged should keep their privilege everybody else should kind of stay in their place so that's uh, they're they're latin american conservatives in the truest sense and that they want to maintain the order of society above anything else and uh, that order in argentina before it became independent was very much all about the farmers, this hierarchy, and agrarianism. So the Federales are very much fighting to preserve that old agrarian order. So that's the uh, big struggle for the soul of Argentina, and it uh, absolutely just racks them for the first 50 years of their existence. The parties are constantly going back and forth. There's low-level political violence, occasional civil wars, that sort of thing. So it all kind of comes to a head in the Platine War, when they fight against Brazil, and they're fighting basically for control of Uruguay, as we'll see this uh, political division is sort of playing out in Uruguay as well, and uh, both Argentina and Brazil are fighting a proxy war that turns into a proper war. Uh, but Brazil wins. They wipe out Argentina. The previous dictator, De Rosas, is taken out, well not taken out, but he's deposed by the Brazilians as well as a faction of Argentinians led by one Justo José de Arquiza, who was, uh, 
he was not a puppet of Brazil, but he worked with Brazil. Uh, kind of saw his kind of saw his opportunity. He was sort of a warlord who used the opportunity, worked with Brazil, and took over Argentina for himself. So he became the new dictator in 1852. Uh, Brazil helped him to rise up, and he was a federale. He uh, believed in that sort of conservative order of society, and of course uh, the people in Buenos Aires were not very happy with him. So in 1859, the Unitarios rise up. They're led by a man named Bartolome Mitre, and they try to depose Urquiza in 1859 and fail, but they continue agitating. Buenos Aires even briefly declares independence from the rest of Argentina. And uh, in 1861, they kind of try again. This time, they have a lot more luck. They take down Urquiza in 1861, and uh, Bartolome Mitre becomes the new leader of Argentina. And he is a Unitario. He's based in Buenos Aires. He's interested in the urban interests. But really importantly, they don't kill Urquiza, they don't uh, imprison him, Urquiza just retires. He retires to his palace and basically stays there, which means he's a constant threat. There's always that threat that uh, if things start going too poorly for the Unitarios, or you know, if Urquiza manages to get a strong ally, he will rise up again and he's going to try and come for power again. So it's something that was absolutely hovering over the administration of Argentina at the time, this threat of Urquiza coming back and retaking his power. So that was the main concern for Argentina when the war began. Not necessarily Paraguay, not necessarily foreign affairs, but their own chaotic state of affairs. This threat of Urquiza in the countryside rising up again and retaking his power. So this was very much what Argentina was focused on, um, and it plays a big role in the coming conflict. <laughs> So let's move on to the smallest, but in a lot of ways, in some ways, the most important part of the war, Uruguay. There we go. So in Uruguay, uh, as we said, it becomes independent as a compromise between Brazil and Argentina. They're fighting each other over it. Neither one can beat the other. So they decide that, well, if you can't have it, then... If, if I can't have it, then you can't have it either, excuse me. And uh, so they agree, uh, they agree to let Uruguay become an independent nation that they're both just going to meddle in. So a lot like Argentina, Uruguay has this huge social political division. And it's, uh, it takes the form of the Blancos, or the Whites, and the Colorados, or the Colorfuls. So the Blancos, like their name implies, wear white. The Colorados wear red. And... Uh, that's involved in all of their uniforms. It's how they tell each other apart. You can see on the right there are these armbands that are worn by uh, by members of the various political part of the two political parties, and they're white or red depending on who they support. And it lets you know immediately whether they're on your team or you should hate them. So, of course, in a situation like this, uh, things rapidly escalate escalate into civil war. So, in 1836, that begins, and it begins. 15 whole years of conflict. So initially the Colorados do very well. They manage to take the entire country. They drive out the Blancos. But at this time, that Argentine dictator, uh, Argentinian dictator, excuse me, uh, De Rosas, he's a supporter of the Blancos. So he allows the Blancos to buy weapons from Argentina. He allows their leaders to hide out in Argentina to rebuild their army. And once they're good and ready, the Blancos re invade Uruguay and they take pretty much the entire country with the exception of the capital, Montevideo. Um, so that city, excuse me, <clears throat> let me take a, let me take a drink here, one moment. Yeah, only a few minutes in and already dehydrated. Oh, so much better. All right. So the Colorados hold out for eight years as uh, Montevideo is, is sieged. Um, the, the Blancos, with Argentinian support, they surround the city. But uh, the liberals have a lot of support in Europe and also in the United States, pretty much the whole world. It's kind of pulling for these liberals. They, uh, they're not a huge fan of how Argentina handled the matter. So the... Montevideo is on the coast, it has a port, and it gets resupplied constantly by the French and the British. Additionally, a lot of Italians uh, 
become and become foreign volunteers, including very notably Giuseppe Garibaldi. He actually comes to Uruguay and he fights as a volunteer for the Colorados. That's where he gets a lot of his initial mil military experience that he later goes on to use in unifying Italy. So... The Colorados have a ton of international support. It allows them to hold out for eight years in the Great Siege, and it finally ends when Argentina gets defeated by Brazil in the Platine War, and uh, everything collapses, and the Colorados are able to retake the entire uh, country of Uruguay and basically become a client state of Brazil at that point. So uh, from then on, Brazil very freely intervenes in Uruguay whenever it deems it necessary, and it does so on several occasions. So that's kind of the situation in Uruguay. They had just gotten over a nasty, nasty civil war that lasted 15 years. They were a client state of Brazil, but still very, very paranoid, much like Argentina, because the Blancos were not completely destroyed. The Blancos actually get reincorporated into the political process pretty quick and become just another political party. And they're always jockeying for power. They always have that chance that they're going to try and seize power violently as well. So Uruguay and Argentina both very, very distracted by their own internal divisions. And so now we come to the man himself. Francisco Solano Lopez. <laughs> so Paraguay, boundless ambition. So as I, uh, as I kind of alluded to, Paraguay was originally part of the Viceroyalty of La Plata, just like Argentina. But when Argentina rose up and tried to declare independence, Paraguay actually stayed loyal to Spain. Uh, most of the Spanish officers, most of the Spanish aristocrats and command structure fled to Paraguay when the war in Argentina went poorly. And Argentina actually invades Paraguay and tries to take it, uh, since it is, you know, part of the Viceroyalty of La Plata, they believe they should control all of it. And the Paraguayans, with the help of the Spanish, actually fight back very effectively. But, unfortunately for the Spanish, during the war, the uh, continental Spanish, the, uh, the real aristocrats, they kind of use the, they kind of use the colonists and the Native Americans who uh, inhabit Paraguay, they use them as cannon fodder, they treat them very poorly, they definitely have an arrogant air about them, and uh, well this pisses off the uh, Paraguayans to the point that they actually throw the Spanish out and decide to be independent as well. So, once the threat from Argentina is gone, Paraguay gets rid of the Spanish as well, just because they were treated so poorly while they were fighting the war for the Spanish, and they become their own independent country, and they are extremely paranoid about Argentina coming after them again, so they become a di dictatorship almost immediately. They start as a republic, like a year into that, uh, they end up as a dictatorship. Uh, the dictator is one de Francia, and uh, he focuses on building a really strong army and uh, lots of good defenses because you never know when Argentina is going to come for you again. Argentina absolutely thought that they should control the entire vice royalty of La Plata, that they should control Paraguay. So Paraguay kind of becomes just a very small defensive powerhouse. They are, they don't have a huge economy, but they focus really, really heavily on the army, and they build up strong defenses. They have some great, great natural defenses as well. They have rivers, they have swamps, and they uh, set up a very effective defense against Argentina or any of their other neighbors coming at them again and trying to make them part of their country. So that was the focus of the first two dictators. The third dictator is one Francisco Solano Lopez, and he becomes the leader of Paraguay in 1862 when his father dies. Lopez is known widely as the Napoleon of La Plata. He spends a lot of his youth in France, actually. He goes to the, uh, the really the elite French military school. He picks up a lot of continental war tactics, and he is a huge, huge admirer of Napoleon, both uh, Napoleon I and also Napoleon III, who was ruling France at the time. He's a huge admirer of the Napoleons, and he, he fancies himself a military genius as well. And it's not without reason. He's actually a fantastic general. He uh, has a really, really great grasp of military affairs. He's always been interested in them. He's a uh, 
He's pretty up on the uh, modern technology, the modern tactics. As I said, he studies in France for a lot of his youth, picks up on continental tactics. So he's actually a pretty fantastic general, and he is an extremely, extremely charismatic leader. As we'll see, when the war situation gets really, really ugly for Paraguay, he manages to keep the country together, and he actually does a fantastic job. If if they didn't have such a charismatic leader, the war probably would have ended several years earlier. But Lopez is extremely charismatic. He is a very, very good general. He is extremely prideful as well, and this is going to come into play as well. He definitely sees himself as the Napoleon of La Plata. And uh, this, this is kind of his downfall. But he is a fantastic general. He is a very charismatic leader. He understands war. He understands statecraft. If he had control of a more powerful country than Paraguay, he probably would have done great things. But unfortunately, he was stuck with his tiny little Paraguay. I don't think he'd have it any other way, though. He, he relished the challenge. So, uh, yes... Francisco Solano Lopez absolutely obsessed with the military, and he dreams of greatness. He, he wants to live up to his billing as the Napoleon of La Plata and become a great conqueror. He wants to secure, of course, more resources and also an Atlantic port for Paraguay. And this is a very, very common thing for any landlocked country. Your number one political goal is usually going to be, if you can, get a port because ports are just such an important thing for engaging in international trade, for having commerce. Just everything really depends on your ability to get to the ocean. So it's the number one, the number one priority for Lopez is to get a port. And of course, like any nation, he wants to secure more resources, make his people richer, make himself and his army more powerful. All pretty basic stuff. So... He wants more resources, he wants an Atlantic port, and he sees a chance to get them, and he takes it. So, let's talk about that chance. So, in 1860, the Blancos actually win an election and retake control of Uruguay peacefully. As I said, after the Civil War was over, they were reintegrated uh, into the Uruguayan political life. They just they just participated as another political party from that point on, and they were actually successful in 1860. They won an election, they retook control of Uruguay. This absolutely infuriated the Colorados, and things quickly, quickly spiraled out of control. So in 1863, the leader of the Colorados, Venacio Flores, he launches an armed uprising. He is done compromising with the, with the Blancos. He launches his armed uprising. He calls it the Cruzada Libertadora, or the Liberation Crusade. So Paraguay sees its chance here, because... As I said, Uruguay has Montevideo. That's a fantastic port. So if Paraguay can uh, make Uruguay a client state, then suddenly they have a really, really, really nice port that they can use. So Paraguay sees its chance, and Lopez immediately sides with the Blancos. He begins sending them aid because he believes that... Uh, well, one, he's politically more aligned with the conservative Blancos, and two, he believes that it's just a better bet. I mean, the Blancos control the government. They're probably going to crush these rebels. So, so Lopez bets on the Blancos and begins sending aid. But of course, Brazil is the regional power at the time. They have stated before that they will intervene in Uruguay whenever they can, and Brazil supports the Colorados politically. Um, so they attempt to mediate, they attempt to come to a peaceful solution between the uh, Colorados and the Blancos, but, I mean, Flores freaking calls it a liberation crusade. That <laughs> kind of implies that he's not re really willing to compromise, and Brazil finds that out pretty quickly. Once they learn that Paraguay is supporting the Blancos, that's it. They decide that they need to intervene militarily in Uruguay, get the Colorados back in control. And uh, they decide to do that pretty quickly. Argentina also supports the Colorados at this time. Again, um, Mitre had taken control of Argentina. He was the leader of the Unitarios, the Liberal Party. So, of course, there was a lot of ideological overlap between uh, the Unitarios and the Colorados. So Argentina was very much in favor of the Colorados as well. They don't 
plan on a military intervention. Again, their own house is kind of not in order. They're just recovering from their civil war. There's always that threat of Arkitsa out in the countryside. So they don't plan on a military intervention, but they do send aid to the Colorados. So there's a conflict of interest here. There's a proxy war almost. We have Paraguay siding with the Blancos. We have Brazil and Argentina siding with the Colorados. And this conflict of interest it becomes Lopez's casus belli. It becomes the cause for war against Brazil. So, basically in 1860, probably the end of 1863 going into 1864, Lopez had decided on war and he begins to prepare his army. So let's have a look at the armies at the start of the conflict. So Paraguay's military. Uh, Lopez knows that his neighbors are much larger than he is. They have a much bigger population. His success is going to depend on going absolutely all in. So in 1864, he begins mobilizing, and by 1865, Paraguay has raised an army of 38,137 men by mobilizing all men of military age in the entire country. All of the men... 18 to 45, I believe, get mobilized into the army. Um, and that makes Paraguay's army the largest and the best trained in South America. As I said, Lopez was a great military mind. He knew how to train these uh, soldiers. He instructed them in modern warfare. They were very well trained, very well drilled, and they, for a moment, had the most powerful army in South America. Believe it or not, that tiny little Paraguay has this amazing army, and this alarms the hell out of Brazil, obviously. Unfortunately, Paraguay is also pretty poor, as you would imagine. Most of their weapons are very outdated. Most of the infantry still have flintlocks, and they only have one battery of modern rifled artillery. Everything else are old iron and bronze smoothbores, a lot of them left over from when Paraguay was a Spanish colony. So, they don't have the best equipment, but they do have amazing training, and they do have really, really amazing numbers, because Lopez goes all in on mobilizing. They also... Very interestingly, for a landlocked country, they have a navy. However, this makes a lot more sense than you might think because Paraguay is, the borders of Paraguay basically trace two rivers. The, uh, excuse me, the western border of Paraguay is the Paraguay River, the southern border is the Parana River. So that means that having a strong navy is definitely a matter of national security. A river-going navy that can control the river, make sure that uh, opposing armies can't cross it, it's very much in Paraguay's interest. So Paraguay is landlocked, but it has a navy, and the navy plays a very important role in its defense. Unfortunately, it's not a very large navy. They only have two real steamer warships, as well as 16 converted merchant ships, but it's enough to, it's enough to deter, certainly. Um, and it's an, all that Paraguay could afford. So, pretty amazing. Not a whole lot of other landlocked countries make any sort of investment into a navy or really even have a chance to, but for Paraguay, the navy, absolutely vital. So let's move on then to their primary antagonist, Brazil. So, kind of as we've been hinting at, Brazil was the big bad power in South America at the time, and they had access to everything they could possibly want. Um, at the start of the war, Brazil's army is small. They really weren't expecting uh, a war, certainly not an attack from Paraguay. Um, so they start in 1864 with less than 2,000 men in the army, but once they begin to mobilize, once they begin to get on a war footing, this swells to almost 200,000. And they're armed with the best that money can buy. They have mini percussion rifles, Belgian-made, uh, also the latest muzzle-loaded rifled artillery that Brazil purchased primarily from Britain. So this is all the best stuff, the most modern, uh, modern military equipment. Uh, Brazil is the dominant power, they can afford it, and so they outfit their soldiers with it. it additionally, they also have a navy, and it's a much, much better navy than poor Paraguay can afford. They have 40 warships, and many of them are larger and more powerful than Paraguay's two dinky little steam corvettes. So it looks very much like a mismatch, and this is not even including Argentina and Uruguay. Just Paraguay, or just Brazil looks like more than a match for Paraguay, but uh, we're going to throw in Argentina and Uruguay as well. Luckily for Paraguay, 
Argentina and Uruguay are nowhere near as strong as Brazil. So <laughs> you'll notice in the title, I called it Argentina and Uruguay along for the ride, because in a lot of ways, that's basically what they were. So in 1864, uh, Mitre actually downsizes the army from 10,000 to 6,000 soldiers. And then <laughs> pretty much immediately after that, uh, the war breaks out and he has to reverse that. It's really embarrassing. It causes a ton of chaos. But it kind of shows you that the state, the state that Argentina is in, they thought a, an army of 6,000 soldiers was uh, sufficient for their defense. And uh, they have to backpedal on that very quickly. Once the uh, war gets going, they're bolstered by 15,000 natu na National Guardsmen. And they also get a lot of foreign volunteers, mostly Italians. The Italians are involved in, uh, in Argentina again. There's always been a huge, huge Italian population in Argentina. So a lot of Italians join as foreign volunteers and they help bolster Argentina's ranks. Uh, Uruguay is even smaller than Argentina, but they had just got done fighting that huge civil war. They have a lot of veterans who they can reorganize. So they send a very impressive number for Uruguay, 5,500 soldiers to fight in Paraguay, including their elite Florida division. So yes, Florida man was involved in this conflict and he was quite the terror. <laughs> he was, he did Florida man things. Absolutely. Absolutely did Florida man things and uh, Paraguay was much the worse for it. So, at the start of the conflict, both armies, they have a nightmarish variety of obsolete weapons at the start. I think uh, one of the sources I read on this uh, called it the Quartermaster's worst, worst Nightmare, because, you know, they have some percussion rifles, they have some flintlocks, they have everything in between. They're all different makes, all different models, they come from all over the world, different calibers, so on and so forth. It's almost impossible to supply the Argentina, Argentinian and Uruguayan army. Uh, but as the war goes on, as the need for professionalism in the army and good logistics becomes more and more apparent, Argentina and Uruguay both kind of get their house in order. They order the latest and greatest weapons from Europe and from the United States, and they outfit them. They kind of have a uniform uh, loadout, and uh, it gets a lot, lot better for Argentina and Uruguay as the war carries on. But uh, again, this is one of the things I was talking about, like there's a big change that occurs. And this is, this is Argentina and Uruguay being dragged into the modern age of warfare, kicking and screaming pretty much. Neither country has much of a navy to speak of, which is a little more surprising. You would imagine that Argentina would have a decent navy as well. And maybe Uruguay, since they're both coastal, their they're capital cities are both along the coast. So you would think they'd have a better navy, but neither of them has much to speak of. And uh, just talking about that uh, image on the left there, that's a gaucho, which is a South American cowboy. And Argentina used them pretty extensively as cowboy cavalry. Uh, sent them pretty much as light cavalry scouts, that sort of thing. So yeah, they basically had cowboys as their light cavalry. Kind of shows you the state of the Argentinian army in the beginning, especially. So, <laughs> so yeah, along for the ride, I think, is a very, very good way of putting it. So... Let's talk about the plan. And as an educational aid, I also have a, a little, uh, well, a little historical meme. This probably would have been really fresh about a year ago, but, uh, you know, we're going to have the Lopez status here. So here is the status of Francisco Solano Lopez as things kind of, uh, as things kind of progress, as portrayed by the one and only Mr. Incredible. Will he become canny? Will he become uncanny? Let's wait and see. So... Lopez knows that he needs a very good plan if he's going to defeat Brazil. Again, he's terribly outnumbered. Brazil has a better navy, they have a larger army, they have a much larger economy. So he needs a great plan if he is going to win the war. And he makes some, he makes some assumptions. And these assumptions turn out to maybe not be the best assumptions. So... Lopez's plan is to launch a lightning-fast offensive, much like Napoleon did. Again, this guy is a huge Napoleon fanboy. So he wants a lightning-fast offensive 
just this brilliant, brilliant attack that wins a quick victory, scatters his opponents, uh, makes them unable to respond quickly, and basically creates a fire accompli before anyone can respond. And you know, that's not a bad idea. It's, uh, it's not a terrible strategy for a small nation like Paraguay. A lot of times, the best choice is to do a surprise ferocious offensive that takes your opponent off guard. So, not a terrible plan. Not a terrible plan at all. So, he wants to seize these two Brazilian provinces that you can see kind of to the northeast of Paraguay, there's Mato Grosso, and to the southeast of Paraguay, there's, there's Rio Grande do Sul. So he wants to seize these provinces as quickly as possible. This means that the Brazilian army, which is currently intervening in Uruguay there, is going to be cut off from any sort of land supply. At that point, he's going to wheel his army back, he's going to enter Uruguay, and he's going to work with the Blancos to destroy both the Brazilian army and the Colorados. If it succeeds, he's going to have control over Mato Grosso and Rio Grande do Sul. He's going to have these two amazing provinces for resources. They're both very, very rich in resources. Um, and he's also going to have political control over Uruguay. Uruguay is going to, to basically become a client state of Paraguay. So both of his big objectives will be achieved if, the, if this plan succeeds. He'll take the resources of Mato Grosso and Rio Grande do Sul. He'll control Uruguay and its fantastic port of Montevideo. And he will be in a much, much stronger position than he is now. So this is everything that he could possibly want is this plan right here. If he pulls it off, it's going to be perfect. What could go wrong? So he also believes that Argentina, though they're aiding Uruguay, uh, they're going to stay neutral. And that's because they cannot risk Urquiza rising up while their troops are busy fighting. That's not a bad, not a bad call at all. It's probably a pretty reasonable assumption. Argentina's not going to want to send their troops off to fight a foreign war and just leave themselves open for Urquiza to rise up and retake the country. So it's not a bad, not a bad idea at all. The plan is pretty good, but unfortunately there are two things that Lopez does not count on. One, he believes that once he seizes Mato Grosso and Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil will basically give up. Brazil uh, will not have the political will necessary to retake these provinces. He's also kind of counting on Rio Grande do Sul rising up in his favor, because again, we talked about the Ragamuffin War when we were talking about uh, Brazil. This was the province where it occurred. This was the province where those farmers rose up against Brazil just a few years ago. So he knows there's a lot of separatist... Uh, sentiment in Rio Grande do Sul anyways, if he can take it over, he can probably ally with a lot of those latent rebels, maybe create a semi-autonomous province and uh, have a lot of support for his rule in Rio Grande do Sul. Maybe they'll even rise up and help him fight off the Brazilians if they try to take the province back. So he makes those suppositions. He makes, uh, he makes those guesses. Unfortunately, he misjudges the Brazilians. Uh, the Brazilians are absolutely willing to fight a war to the death for these provinces. Uh, the other mistake he makes is believing that Argentina will stay neutral, that they are too scared of Urquiza to rise up and uh, they will not oppose his plans. And uh, you know, this unfortunately turns out to be not the case as well. But there are a few points on the map to really, really be uh, aware of. Uh, so you can see there's Mato Grosso, Rio Grande do Sul, those two Brazilian provinces. This is where most of the offensive takes place. Once things turn around and the fighting starts in Paraguay, there's a few things to notice. So you can see, as I said, the uh, western border is the Rio Paraguay, the River Paraguay. The southern border is the Parana. And you can kind of see near the confluence of those two rivers, there's that little dot. It's called Humaita. Humaita is an amazing fortress. It controls the entrance to Paraguay. There's no other easy way to access uh, the interior of Paraguay. So this is key. This is where most of the war is fought around Humaita, around the Parana River, the Paraguay River, and Humaita. So once uh, things turn against Paraguay, most of the war is fought in this tiny little area kind of between Humaita and that uh, southern Parana River. So... Just a few things to be aware of on the map. Uh, Misiones and Corrientes are also uh, those two Argentinian provinces to the uh, immediate southeast and south of Paraguay. There's also some action going on there. 
So those are kind of the, uh, this is kind of a map of the theater of operations. Those are the important places to know. So again, Paraguay wants to seize those Brazilian provinces, Mato Grosso, Rio Grande do Sul. It wants to also possibly control Misiones and Corrientes if Argentina enters. Most of the fighting in the war is done, however, around Humaita, where those two rivers come together at the corner of Paraguay's border. So hopefully that gives you some geographic sense of where things take place. So let's move on and uh, we'll see what Lopez's status is in the next slide, eh? Yeah. Things going well, but unfortunately my slideshow isn't going well. There we go. All right. So the campaign begins and things start to go well for good old Lopez. So on October 12, 1864, Brazil sends a force of 6,000 men into Uruguay. They begin their military intervention, uh, and Paraguay begins preparing for a counter-intervention. So on November 13th, about a month after that happens, Lopez declares war on Brazil. He actually does so by seizing a steamship going on the Parana River, carrying the new governor of the Rio Grande do Sul province. So he captures that steamship, he takes the new governor hostage, and then he proceeds to declare war on Brazil. So, kind of started things off with a bang. He uh, declares war and immediately sends 8,000 men up into Mato Grosso to seize that province. Again, he's trying for that lightning offensive. He's trying to win the war quickly before he gets ground down under their superior numbers. And this uh, offensive into Mato Grosso goes pretty well. There's a little bit of resistance. A few cities hold out for a few days, but uh, in the end, Mato Grosso's a very, very isolated province. It's mostly rainforest, so the Brazilians can't get a whole lot of help, especially to the southern part of the province. Uh, by April 1865, southern Mato Grosso has fallen to Paraguay, but unfortunately, that rainforest also works in Brazil's favor, uh, Paraguay doesn't really want to advance any further north into the rainforest, so unfortunately the capital of Mato Grosso province never falls to Paraguay, it's just, it's just the southern part, and it kind of comes to a stand, standstill because neither group can really cross the rainforest and hit the other group, so things kind of come to a standstill in Mato Grosso, but um, he's achieved, a, Lopez has achieved a good success there. Things are going pretty much to plan. He would have liked to take the capital, of course, but it's not really possible. Still, his positions in Mato Grosso aren't in any danger. The rainforest is just a gigantic barrier. Nobody can cross it, really. So, simultaneously as this is going on, Lopez prepares his second strike, and he wants to do it quickly. He wants to hit Rio Grande do Sul, the other Brazilian province. You can kind of see that fortified Paraguayan camp there in Mato Grosso. It's, yeah, just a little camp in the jungle, and that's pretty much all it was. This is, uh, Mato Grosso is definitely the sleepiest front of the war, and they pretty much stayed there the entire war just like that. So, Lopez prepares his attack into Rio Grande do Sul, but as he is seizing Mato Grosso, well, things are going on in Uruguay as well. So, <laughs> meanwhile in Uruguay, uh, so Paraguay launches their attack, but Brazil's intervention force continues on with its mission all the same. They enter Uruguay without any sort of resistance from the Blancos, which is absolutely inexcusable. Um, the Blancos should have been resisting that furiously because Brazil manages to link up with the Colorados. They manage to integrate their armies and they're suddenly a very, very dangerous force. So on December 6, 1864, Brazil besieges a really strategic Atlantic port called Paysandu. Um, and the Blancos are unable to hold it for very long. It gets shelled into submission in 26 days, and uh, this is not, uh, they had no intention of leaving the city intact. They were not pulling any punches. Paysandu is basically a smoking crater after the end of this. So, shelled into submission, there's basically nothing left. Uh, kind of shows, kind of shows how serious Brazil was about winning the war. Um, and... Once Paysandu falls, it becomes very clear to everyone that the Blancos are a whole lot weaker than Lopez had imagined and hoped. They are fighting, uh, they're basically a paper tiger. They might control the government, but they don't have great control of the army. A lot of it defects to the Colorados. The Blancos are in huge trouble, and unfortunately, 
Although Lopez tried to be fast with his offensive, he's not yet in any sort of position to help out the Blancos in Uruguay. Although they beg for it, they launch a few desperate attacks, hoping that, uh, er, that, hoping that Paraguay will step in and assist them. The Blancos are very, very weak, and they're on the way out. And this is the first major miscalculation that Lopez had made in choosing this war, is that... Uh, he hoped that the Blancos would be able to hold out, tie down the Brazilian army long enough for him to take those provinces, and then he can come in and destroy the Brazilian army. It's not working out. The Blancos are rapidly collapsing. So Brazil moves right on. They just uh, march right through the entire country. They besiege Montevideo, the capital, and that falls very, very quickly without much of a fight. February 22nd, 1865. So about four months i think brazil enters in october yeah so brazil enters uruguay in october by february uh montevideo has fallen and the situation in uruguay is basically under control venacio flores who launched his liberation crusade against the blancos he takes control of the entire country of uruguay and of course immediately joins brazil's war against paraguay so we have two members of the triple alliance now aligned against paraguay things kind of not going for, to plan so, Lopez is not terribly perturbed, though. He still believes that a quick victory is possible. But to win that victory, he kind of needs to go through Argentina. So, in order to attack Rio Grande do Sul, Lopez really needs to cross that Misiones province that I pointed out. He doesn't have a direct land border with uh, Rio Grande do Sul. There's a ton of jungle that he doesn't really control if he wants to take the direct route uh, kind of through and attack Rio Grande do Sul from the north. It's not really practical. Much easier, really only practical, to attack Rio Grande do Sul by crossing the Misiones province. So... He makes another gamble, and he believes that Argentina is a lot weaker than it is. He basically tries to intimidate them. He asks Argentina for permission, and I say ask, but really it's more like he tries to extort Argentina for permission. He believes that they're going to back down because they're scared to death of Urquiza rising up, but they refuse. And notably, Argentina also refuses a similar request from Brazil to cross Misiones province and attack Paraguay. But, um, so... Lopez believes, again, that uh, if Argentina enters the war, Urquiza is going to rise up, they're going to collapse rapidly, so he believes there's actually not too much risk in declaring war on Argentina. So he declares war on Argentina, he quickly moves east and south to seize the provinces of Misiones and Corrientes. So on April 13th, five Paraguayan steamers sail down the Piranha River and destroy two of Argentina's three warships and bomb the border city of Corrientes into submission. This is the city, not the province. They're both named the same thing. Um, like New York and New York. Um, he also... Uh, <coughs> no, excuse me. So Mitre rushes 2,000 men north to retake Corrientes. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a huge moment of panic when the first city falls to them, and uh, Mitre actually makes a very, very famous speech in Buenos Aires and claims that uh, in three days we shall be in the barracks, in three weeks we shall be at the front, and in three months we shall be in Asuncion, which is the capital of Paraguay. Uh, that doesn't really, really, uh, doesn't really play out that way, but uh, it is a very famous speech made by... Uh, made by Bartolomé Mitre, the leader of Argentina, when they learn that Corrientes has fallen. So they rush 2,000 men north to retake Corrientes. They have a really long and nasty fight over the city, briefly take the city from Paraguay, but some reinforcements arrive and force them out of the city a day later. While they're busy with that, uh, Lopez sends a much larger force, 12,000 men, who absolutely steamroll Misiones' problem, a province, excuse me, and then they create that huge problem for Brazil. They directly threaten Rio Grande do Sul. So things are going pretty well for Lopez here. He's basically taken what he wants from Argentina very quickly without a whole lot of resistance, and he now threatens the second Brazilian province that he needs for his plan to succeed. So, on May 1st of that year, 1865, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, they realize the situation is dire, and they sign the famous Treaty of the Triple Alliance. So this is not only an alliance between the uh, three countries, it's also an agreement on what Paraguay will, uh, or how Paraguay will be treated after the war, what their objectives are. And it basically states that, uh, 
Lopez has got to go. Lopez has no role in the future of Paraguay. Any peace deal that doesn't involve Lopez stepping down will not be accepted. So they pass that on May 1st. The war goals are pretty much set. And then they go about trying to achieve them. So, the first thing that happens in favor of the alliance, really, is that, as I mentioned, the navy was actually really, really important to Paraguay. Um, and he knows that Brazil has a much stronger navy than he does. If he allows Brazil to control the rivers, it's pretty much over for Paraguay. There aren't a whole lot of roads in, uh, in that part of South America. Pretty much all travel gets done on the rivers because, like, who the hell's going to make a road through the rainforests and through the deserts and uh, through all of that? All of that bad land, it's just not done. So pretty much all of the travel in that part of the world is done on the rivers. If you control the rivers, you control pretty much everything. And Lopez is keenly aware that Brazil has a huge number advantage on the rivers. So he hatches a plan. And it's a very, very clever plan. Again, to Lopez's credit, he is a very, very clever military mind. So what he does is he sets up a battery of his finest guns. Remember I said they had one battery of modern artillery? He uses that for this plan. He sets an ambush along the riverside, north of where he knows the Brazilian Navy is hanging out. And uh, then... The plan is to have his navy go down, sail down the river in the middle of the night, and attack the Brazilian ships at dawn. This is the perfect time to attack the ships because hardly anyone is going to be on them at dawn if you pull off this surprise attack. The, the sailors typically slept on the land. They only went on the ships during the day when they were doing whatever they wanted to do, whatever they needed to do, but they slept on the land. So if you attack at dawn, you're going to catch those ships when they are very lightly Manned, if manned at all you're going to be able to hopefully capture a bunch of them and then you're going to be able to destroy whatever does manage to fight you because it's uh, fighting you from a position of huge disadvantage they're disorganized they're confused so it's not a bad plan at all so again the three points are they're going to launch the attack at dawn they're going to try and board and steal as many of the brazilian ships as possible if some of the Brazilian ships fight back, they're going to do the best they can to destroy them and then retreat. They're going to go right back up the river and they're going to lead whatever is left of the Brazilian fleet into that battery of guns waiting on the riverbank that's hopefully going to shoot them to pieces. It's not a bad plan at all. It's very, very clever. Um, but unfortunately, the man that Lopez puts in charge of this operation is a complete idiot. So, Pedro Ignacio Mesa completely bungles Lopez's brilliant plan, and he does so by pressing on when he shouldn't. So, things start out well. They manage to get the uh, battery of artillery where it needs to be on the riverside. Uh, Mesa sets out in the middle of the night. He's uh, sailing towards the Brazilian uh He's sailing towards the Brazilian position, and the position is in a, a tributary called the Riachuelo, which is the name of the battle. Um, he's sailing there, and one of his warships breaks down. So, the reasonable thing to do here would be to, if you can't get it fixed very quickly, you either need to turn around and try again some other night, or you need to go on without that particular warship if you think you can still pull off the operation. Mesa does neither of these things. Mesa waits several hours for this warship to be repaired, for it to uh, rejoin the convoy, and this completely spoils the element of surprise, which was absolutely vital to the operation. Instead of, arising, instead of arriving at dawn, when they were supposed to arrive, the Paraguayan Navy shows up around 11 a.m. All of the ships have all of their sailors on them, and Mesa knows it. He knows he can't complete the mission as assigned, so instead he decides to just kind of do a lame-ass uh, version of a drive-by. He's going to just float his ships down the river, take some shots at them, turn around, and come back. Why? I have no idea. This is... this is kind of the most... this is the biggest head-scratcher. Even bigger than Lopez picking the fight itself, 
because he had a pretty decent plan. If things went well for him, things would have worked out. But this is the biggest head scratcher of the entire damn war. Mesa attempts to do a drive-by. He attempts to just float by the Brazilian fleet, take some shots at it, turn around, and get out of there. Uh, this goes about as well as you would expect. <laughs> Brazil... They're, all of their ships are totally manned. They're ready to go. When they see the Paraguayan ships show up, they go into battle formation, and uh, Mesa starts shooting at them. Brazil re returns fire much more effectively than the Paraguayan ships. He sinks several of them in the first moment. So now Mesa's panicking. Now Mesa turns around. He, uh, wa he wants to go back up the river. He wants to lead those Brazilian ships into that surprise battery of guns that was waiting for them and he manages to do that um, and they're effective at first the guns take down two brazilian ships one of them totally sunk the other one heavily damaged but after that it's over the rest of the brazilian ships swarm the paraguayan fleet they sink most of their warships and from that moment on the paraguayan navy is no longer a factor brazil has complete control of the rivers and strange as it is to say this war against a landlocked country is in a lot of ways decided by this naval battle i can't think of any other uh, i can't think of any other circumstance in history where a landlocked country is defeated in a naval battle and that pretty much decides the war because now brazil has complete control of the piranha river they can move their troops as they please paraguay is totally cut off from any sort of international markets from any sort of offensive capabilities uh moving troops down the piranha river doesn't sound like an issue <laughs> yeah yeah you know um so yeah brazil has complete control of the piranha river and in a lot of ways the war is decided right here um, but that doesn't mean the war is over. Again, as we mentioned, Francisco Solano Lopez, an extremely prideful man, he's going to drag this out as long as he possibly can. So, yeah, things kind of not going too great for Lopez here. Things are starting to turn against him, and things only get worse. The momentum ends. So... Paraguay goes ahead and they invade Rio Grande do Sul. They capture the town of Uruguayana on August 6, 1865. Despite its name, it is in Brazil. Um, they capture that town, but the Alliance has had time to kind of get their stuff together. It's been a year since the war was declared almost. They're ready. They have 16,000 troops waiting in Rio Grande do Sul for the Paraguayan offensive, and they go into action immediately once Uruguayana falls. So a Paraguayan vanguard goes past Uruguayana, and they run into they run into these 16,000 Alliance troops. They get enveloped. They get almost completely destroyed. Only 200 of the 3,200 men survive the Battle of Yatay without uh, being captured. So the Paraguayan vanguard is destroyed. They've lost a significant uh, amount of their men right there. And then the Alliance moves, moves on, and they bottle up the rest of the Paraguayan army in Uruguayana. And this is the first big ground battle of the war. Everybody knows it's super important. Both Bartolome Mitre, who's the president of Argentina, and Emperor Pedro II, they personally join the siege. They uh, command their troops personally for this battle. It's a huge momentum boost, and it shows just how important, just how politically united uh, the Triple Alliance is in taking down Paraguay here. And things go about how you would expect for Paraguay. They have pushed into Rio Grande do Sul very quickly without any sort of consideration for supply lines. They get bottled up in this hostile town. They are totally out of supplies and things go very poorly for them. Uh, on September 18th, what's left of the Paraguayan army surrenders. Only 5,500 are left. 2,500 have already died of starvation and disease just in a month just in a month so it kind of shows you how ill-conceived this offensive into rio grande do sul was they had basically no supplies their supply lines were complete garbage and then they get bottled up it all ends very quickly and from this point on this is basically this is basically paraguay's stalingrad here they are eternally on the defensive from this point on the momentum is completely gone and it's time for the counterattack to begin and begin it does very rapidly 
So the counteroffensive starts uh, starts in the spring of 1866, which is actually the fall in the Southern Hemisphere. I just realized that, but uh, yeah, it starts around March of 1866. So Lopez realizes that the realizes that all momentum is lost. He realizes that his only chance of a win now is to draw back to Paraguay and let the alliance smash itself against his natural and man-made defenses. And that's not a terrible idea either. As I said before, Paraguay has amazing uh, natural and man-made defenses. He has the great fortress of Humaita blocking all entrance into uh, Paraguay. It's blocking any access to Asuncion or any of the major cities. He has... Uh, mountain ranges he has most of the land is very swampy there are a lot of lakes so there are tons of natural barriers that make it almost impossible to uh, maneuver through Paraguay without going through Humaita and then on the other side of the river from Humaita he has the Chaco which is a uh, it's called a desert at the time but it's actually kind of just a semi-arid grassland but uh it was considered impassable um that it was kind of uninhabitable, uninhabitable with 19th century tech, so it was sort of just considered an impassable wasteland. Nobody could take an army through there. There was no one living there. There weren't any resources that an army could survive on. So there are tons of natural and man-made barriers, and it's not a bad idea. It's really not a bad plan to just go on the defensive, let the Alliance break themselves against your defenses, and eventually once they start to take some casualties, there's probably going to be some political divisions rising up. Again, Argentina and Uruguay have their own political problems. They're hesitant to invade Paraguay because they know that if their army is tied up fighting Paraguay, bad things could happen at home. But Brazil... Brazil is the regional hegemon, and they are determined to get rid of Lopez to make sure that Paraguay is never a threat again. Because, uh, again, they're the, regional, they're the regional power. The status quo benefits them. Anything that upsets the status quo, they're going to react very harshly to. So Brazil, again, is the strongest member of the alliance. They managed to do some negotiations, convince Argentina and Uruguay to carry on, and they do. So in the spring of 1866, they go all the way up to the Piranha River and they prepare to cross near a place called Paso de Patria. Lopez meets them uh, with 30,000 troops and starts aggressively raiding them from his fort of Itapiru on the other side of the Piranha. And this is a very effective strategy. They, they lose a lot of troops, they lose a lot of material stolen by the Paraguayans, but they carry on nonetheless. And Lopez on April 16th makes a terrible mistake. So, the Brazilians develop a really, really complicated plan. It's a very, very modern river crossing operation, actually. There's a ton of support. It's very deliberate. It reminds me a lot of how modern armies cross a river, because they send these groups, they make sure their crossing is secured, they have artillery support, naval support, so on and so forth. It's actually a very well-considered, very well-conducted naval crossing. It needs to be, because they assume, as soon as we cross that river... Lopez is coming for us. He's going to try and destroy whatever comes across the river. And very, very confusingly, their expectations are totally subverted. Marshal Osorio crosses the Piranha River with 14,000 soldiers and Paraguay does nothing. They're aware of them and they do nothing. This is another one of the big head scratchers. Why the hell don't you go all out on an offensive against those troops who are vulnerable having just crossed the river? Paraguay does nothing. Um, so Brazil, over the following days, sends even more troops across the river. On April 17th, Lopez sends a tiny force of 1,800 men to oppose them, which gets, of course, absolutely stomped. And uh, seeing this, realizing that his position was lost for some reason, I really, really don't know why he didn't just uh, aggressively attack them when they were on his side of the river. Um, so Lopez abandons the fortress of Itapiru and retreats up into the marshes. He gets behind that next big natural barrier of the marshes of Estero Biaco. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is another huge, huge head-scratcher from Lopez. As I said, he's a very good general. He's not hes not a military genius by any stretch of the imagination. Um, why he didn't just immediately bring the hammer down on those Brazilian troops crossing the Piranha? No clue. He outnumbered them two to one. If he sent all of his forces there, he probably could have driven them back pretty easily. 
He chose not to. He chose to yield the best natural barrier that they had, the Piranha River. So, things kind of going even worse for Lopez now. And it's re it's uh, reflected in the Lopez status, becoming uh, steadily more uncanny. And then comes Tuyuti. So, the Alliance forces cross the Estero Bayaco marches, and uh, as soon as they cross the marshes, Lopez launches an attack on their vanguard. This is actually a very strong attack. It has a lot of cavalry, and it really threatens the vanguard quite a bit. The only thing that saves the Alliance vanguard is the fact that the Uruguayan veterans of the Civil War are in it. And uh, they manage to hold out for a very long time, show amazing discipline, amazing courage, holding off the Par Paraguayan forces, even though they're terribly outnumbered, and eventually reinforcements arrive. So they fight off that raid, and they make a camp at Tuyuti, which uh, threatens Lopez's camp uh, at Estero Bayaco. So Lopez decides now now to launch an aggressive attack and try to destroy them. Not when they're doing the river crossing and they're vulnerable, but once they've, you know, set up a camp and fortified it, now we're going to launch the aggressive attack and try to destroy them. So, <laughs> Lopez, as I've said before, he fancies himself to be the next Napoleon. So he draws up an extremely complex plan that involves four different columns of men, each marching to a different objective and attacking it at the same time. So they have to take different routes and they have to reach their targets perfectly in sync because it all relies on the element of surprise. This is inadvisable for many, many, many reasons. Um, you can probably already tell what happens just from the uh, description I gave of it. So he has these four columns of men marching. They need to reach their targets. Again, he's relying on the element of su surprise. He's hoping that if he attacks the Alliance camp in multiple different places, confusion is going to reign. There's going to be disorganization, and he's going to be able to push past and negate their numbers advantage if they're not using those numbers intelligently. So, again, not a bad plan, but probably a little too complex. So, those four columns of men they set out, they are moving across uh, some kind of difficult terrain, especially one column meant to attack the center. It has to go through some pretty nasty marshes, and they are much, much slower than Lopez imagined. They get bogged down. Three of the columns show up, and again, instead of improvising, instead of trying to preserve that element of surprise, those three columns just sit there on their asses and wait for the fourth column to finally arise. Dawn breaks, the scouts of the Alliance see the columns forming up, and they raise the alarm. The element of surprise is once again ruined. Um, so that's two times that, <laughs> two times that, uh, Poor old Lopez, he wanted to get that element of surprise and it just gets completely bungled. This one is absolutely his fault, though. Again, the plan was too complex. It relied on four columns of men reaching their targets perfectly in sync. It was never going to happen. So the element of surprise is, lo is lost. Once the fourth column arrives there, they decide to attack anyways. 24,000 Paraguayan soldiers crash into 32,000 Alliance soldiers at their camp and it is an absolute slaughter. Those two columns in the center, they strike, and they're pretty easily repulsed. Again, the Alliance is totally prepared for them. They're strong in the center. Um, those two columns in the center don't make much progress. However, the two, two columns on the flanks actually do pretty well. The left flank manages to take a redoubt uh, that was holding up a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the Brazilian left flank there. And the right flank swings really wide. It's a very heavy cavalry force. So it swings around and it manages, the Argentinians are on the right. It manages to actually uh, put the Argentinians in a pretty bad situation. They temporarily capture some of the Argentinians' guns, but eventually some cavalry for the Alliance shows up and kind of uh, gets the situation under control. So the center is being forced back. The center is going nowhere. They do have some progress on the flanks. So it's decided, okay, we're going to try a double envelopment. We're going to try and attack both sides on the flanks, try to push towards the, uh, the rear of the enemy in the center. And uh, if we can pull that off, then maybe we can encircle their army. We can destroy everything that way. Uh, as you can probably guess, that's uh, a little ambitious to try and do with a, an outnumbered force against prepared enemies. So that really goes nowhere. 
Uh, in the end, 6,000 Paraguayans are dead, only about 1,000 Alliance soldiers die, and then this includes most of the best cavalry in Paraguay's army. And uh, really, this is kind of a watershed moment for warfare in South America. This is the hard lesson about cavalry that uh, pretty much every country has to learn at some point, uh, or, or did learn at some point. Cavalry is no longer the king of the battlefield now. Um, this teaches pretty much everyone involved. Unfortunately, the Paraguayans have to suffer to learn it, but the Alliance learns this as well. Cavalry can no longer take positions on its own. Used to be something you could do uh, in the 1700s. Absolutely, you could pull that off. But now with uh, the evolution of with the evolution of rifles, with the evolution of rifled cannons, or sorry, excuse me, rifled uh, artillery, uh, it's just not possible anymore. The poor horses get shot to pieces. So this is, Tiuti is the hard lesson about cavalry that everyone has to learn. And it's also the largest battle ever fought on South America. Again, I had hinted th at that at the start of the lecture, that uh, the biggest battle ever fought in South America fought in this war. Not in the 20th century, it's fought right here at Tiuti. So unfortunately goes very very poorly for poor old lopez but things aren't totally ruined for him quite yet <laughs> so after tiuti the alliance uh, doesn't advance for some time uh, this is also probably pretty inexcusable um the Alliance absolutely should have taken advantage of the disorganization of the Paraguayans. They should have pushed forward and probably could have broken through to Humaita if they had they chose to do so. But again, it's a force of three different countries. There are political aspects at play. Um, they're operating in a very low supply environment. Again, this is basically just marshes and jungles. There's not a whole lot of civilization around. Um, so they're very cautious. They wait for supply. And Lopez absolutely uses the time he's given to prepare a very strong defense position at Curapaiti. So Lopez constructs a very large earthen wall at Curapaiti, and Curapaiti is right up against the, uh, the Paraguay River, just a little bit south of Humaita. So he basically creates a, a right angle. It goes, uh, goes kind of down from the north and then uh, west towards the uh, Paraguay River. This uh, large earthen wall, it's got 49 guns mounted on it. It has an outer wooden palisade and then some uh, trenches even further out. And uh, between the palisades and the main earthen wall, there's a empty field that they strip all of the trees out of. There's no cover whatsoever. If you're going to assault the earthen wall, you have to cross that open field and get shot to pieces by the guns. So, on September 22nd, 1866, the Alliance forces attempt to do exactly that. Um, they were not aware how strong the defensive position was at Curapaiti. They knew the Paraguayan army was there. They did not know that they were dug in that ferociously. And this was another inexcusable, um, this was another inexcusable failure. There should have been reconnaissance. They should have known what they were getting into. Instead, they just send them in and tell them to, uh, hey, go take that fortification. How bad could it possibly be? And they find out pretty quickly it can be pretty freaking bad. So they take the outer trenches with no problem. Uh, Lopez had ordered his men to not really bother defending them. He knew that the earthen wall was the uh, real, the real uh, defensive position here. So they, they take the outer trenches with no problem. Then they get to the killing field. Um, and things go extremely poorly for them. They also conduct a naval bombardment that's pretty ineffective. Again, because there's no reconnaissance, the naval uh, ships don't really know what to shoot at. So the naval bombardment's ineffective. The army charges across the killing field, and it goes about how you would imagine. The ground is super marshy. The Alliance soldiers get bogged down. They are sitting ducks for the guns that are firing with everything they have. If they do manage to get to the earthen wall, they climb up, they climb up it, and the Paraguayan infantry is waiting for them. So it's just an extremely ill-advised attack. Um, again, most of the, as, as I said, most don't even reach the earthworks. They get blown away by the artillery. The few that do climb up the earthworks and they get immediately shot as soon as they pop their heads up. 
Um, it's just an absolute debacle. Paraguay loses about 100 soldiers, 4,200 alliance soldiers are lost, and this damn near breaks the Triple Alliance. Um, as you can imagine, the, uh, the supply situation was not good. There were political concerns at home. Now you have this horrific, horrific disaster. You've lost so many men. This damn near breaks the alliance as well. It almost, uh, Lopez almost gets what he's looking for. And, uh, oh. No, no, you need to, uh... Oh, my Lopez status is not updating. There we go. <laughs> uh, all right. So yeah, so this almost, almost breaks the alliance. Darn, can't believe my Lopez status didn't update. Here we go. So after that, there's a long pause. As you might imagine, the disaster at Kurapaiti, it halts the alliance and it halts them for 10 whole months. Um, the supply situation is terrible. Disease is starting to take its toll. Tuyuti, which was the main camp, must have been hell on earth at this time. Like, can you imagine? You're out in the jungle, there's hardly any supplies, hardly any food, disease is running rampant, it's hot, it's humid, the accommodations are uncomfortable, you're getting swarmed by flies, <laughs> there's no civilization anywhere to speak of, the food is bad, it just... Uh, hell on earth. Absolute hell on earth in TUT. And unsurprisingly, morale starts to tank. Uh, Argentina and Uruguay, they have their political concerns at home. Argentina actually has an Indian uprising going on in its south, so they have to divert some soldiers to go and take care of that. And Uruguay is always wary of the Blancos rising up again. So at this time, a lot of Argentinian and Uruguayan soldiers go home and they don't return. So the, uh, the alliance force is primarily Brazilians from this point forward. Lopez, of course, takes full advantage of the long pause, and he works feverishly to improve his defenses. He actually conscripts all males, including any boy older than 12 years old. Gets conscripted into the army, he brings in slaves as well, he has everyone digging trenches. The goal is to link up Kurapaiti and Humaita with a gigantic network of trenches, and they succeed in doing that in the uh, 10 months that they have. So. The ground defense from Kurapaiti to Humaita is even more impressive. It's going to be very, very difficult to take it by land. This is the moment when the Alliance is in the greatest danger. If things had gone on as they were going, it's very likely that uh, things would have broken down in Tuyuti. Argentina and Uruguay would have pulled their support entirely, and they might have had to retreat and come to some sort of negotiated settlement with, with Francisco Solano Lopez, uh, which would have been a hell of a win for Lopez. I'm sure he would have taken a white piece at this point, or just a small loss of territory. But, uh, but that is prevented when an actual, in my opinion, an actual military genius shows up and takes control of the Alliance army. His name is the Duke of Cachias, Luis Alves de Lima y Silva. He is a Brazilian nobleman. He's a very, very close friend of Pedro II, who is the emperor at the time. And he is... As I said, in my mind, a true military genius, and we're going to see some of his maneuvers, what he does to uh, undermine the supposed military genius Francisco Lopez. So, Cachillas takes control in November of 1866, and he immediately starts turning things around. He improves the supply lines greatly. He also institutes a hot air balloon corps and uses them for recon. This was one of the big hard lessons that they learned. You need recon, dedicated recon units in modern warfare, so you don't bumble into a Kurapaiti and get absolutely destroyed. So Lopez institutes that and uses hot air balloons to do it, which is a really, really smart way to do it. Um, he also reorganizes the army, he uh, disbands a lot of undermanned battalions or merges them together, so he makes the ar army a lot more efficient, he improves supply lines, he increases recon, again, modernizing the military process, and finally, after 10 months of inactivity in August 1867, they're finally ready to resume the alliance, the uh, offensive, excuse me, the alliance is ready to resume the offensive. And the Duke of Cachias shows that he is a military mastermind by taking down the amazing fortress of Humaita. 
So Humaita is the most impressive fortification in South America by a wide, wide margin. It's known as the South American Sevastopol, or Sevastopol, however you pronounce that, uh, after, the, uh, Russian, uh, after the Russian fortress on the Crimean Peninsula. It controls the Paraguay River. You cannot get to the capital Asuncion without going through Humaita, because you have to take the river up to Asuncion. So, it's flanked by natural obstacles on both sides. It has the Paraguay River to its uh, west. It has a series of very deep marshes and lakes to its east. You cannot go around Humaita easily. And again, on the other side of the Paraguay River, there's the Chaco, which everybody considers to be impassable. However, the Duke of Cachias does not consider the Chaco to be impassable. And again, I don't really know what the thinking was here, why nobody thought that it would be possible to move across the Chaco. It's not like a totally inhospitable desert. It's a grassland. It's a dry grassland, but it's not inhabited, and people just assumed that, oh, you can't take an army across there. There's no civilization there. There's not a whole lot of water. So, uh, yep, can't cross the Chaco. We're totally safe. Uh, and that's kind of silly. So, Cachias shows his military chops by crossing the Chaco. He uh, sends an engineer corps to the other side of the river and has them build a road. And they build it up along north, along the Chaco, where the Paraguayans can't see them deep enough in there. Once the road is done, he sends 5,000 troops into the Chaco. They take that nice road that's been prepared for them, wheel all of their guns, all of their supplies along in carts, and they cross the river north of Humaita. They land at the village of Tai and they begin besieging Humaita from the north. And Lopez absolutely panics. Again, this was, this was something that just nobody, at least on the Paraguayan side, expected. And uh, sometimes something like that happens and it just stuns you. This shouldn't be. How did they get north of us? How did they go across the Chaco? Uh, we never thought that was possible. And so Lopez panics. He goes on the offensive. That's like pretty much the only mode that Lopez had. And it's kind of unfortunate because if he hadn't thrown, thrown so many lives away going on these offensives, he probably would have been a lot more effective defending his country. But again, he worships Napoleon. Napoleon is all about that offensive. Um, so Lopez decides, hey, I've got to go on the offensive too. So he sends another force down towards Teuti. He wants to take their main camp. He wants to throw them into disarray. It's as dumb as it sounds. He loses 2,000 men. It's pointless, and it only undermines his position. Then on February 24th, 1868, things go from bad to worse. The fortress of Humaita controlled the Paraguay River. It had a ton of very large guns pointed at it, but it had not counted on the recent development of ironclads. And ironclads were steamships with, uh, well, ironclad armor on their outside. And they decide they're going to take a risk. They're going to try and pass Humaita and just gamble on the guns of Humaita not being stronger than their armor. And they take a lot of damage trying to, uh, trying to get past Humaita. Again, there are well over there are 62 guns on Humaita most of them are pointed at the river they're all large guns they're firing crazily at these Brazilian ironclads but all five of the ironclads manage to pass Humaita intact damaged but they're intact and this means that the fortress is now completely cut off the Brazilians are on the north side of the river both on the land and in the river which means no more supplies can get to Humaita as a show of force, those Brazilian ironclads continue north. They continue north up the Paraguay River, and they bombard the capital of Asuncion. So, for the first time in the war, Asuncion gets bombarded. That causes a ton of panic. And, uh, really there's nothing that Lopez can do. Uh, Humaita is bottled up. All that he can do is slowly evacuate his troops. And he does so. It's a long process. Again, those Brazilian troops crossed the Paraguay in, no in November of 1867. Humaita holds out until July 24th, when they are entirely out of supplies, when most of the defenders have already evacuated, the very last ones uh, get out of there, and on July 24th, the Brazilians enter Humaita. The greatest fortress in South America has fallen. The key to Paraguay, as it's known, has now been taken by the Brazilians. And they 
naturally burn it to the ground so that Paraguay can never take advantage of it again. So Humaita gets raised to the ground. There's nothing left of it today except for a church that's bombed out. It's kind of amazing. <coughs> yeah. Take another sip here. Oh, whoa, wow, wow, wow. Freaking out here. Okay. That was special. So Humaita has fallen. Everything is falling apart for Francisco Solano Lopez. Poor guy. And then things go from bad to worse. So Lopez rushes north. He knows he's got to defend Asuncion. There are still plenty of natural barriers to do so. Paraguay is extremely difficult to invade. So he rushes north. He gets behind a stream called the Picasiri. And he just constructs another defensive line. And again, he's banking on some really, really strong natural barriers. There are even more lakes and marshes to the east of him. And the Chaco is to the uh, west. Very, very curiously, though, he doesn't, for being such a supposed military genius, he doesn't really expect it when Cachias does the exact same thing to get around his line the second time. Which is kind of really, really inexcusable. This is this is on the level of the Riachuelo right here. So Cachias once again just bypasses his line by building another road through the Chaco, and this is known as the Picasiri maneuver. Um, so in early December, nineteen thousand Brazilian troops teleport behind the lines of Francisco Solano Lopez. Probably say nothing personnel, kid, and then they begin. The Decembrada, the December campaign to hopefully end the war, to destroy the Picasiri line, to take Asuncion. So, of course, <laughs> once again, when uh, Lopez realizes that the Brazilians have materialized behind his lines, uh, he panics. He sends a force up north to try and block them from moving any, any further inland. They meet at the Itororo stream and have a very bloody long clash over control of a single strategic bridge. It changes hands multiple times during the battle. And in the end, the final charge is led by the Duke of Cachias himself. Uh, the alliance takes the bridge and drives off the Paraguayans. Then at December 11th, uh, there's a delay action fought by the Paraguayans to give Lopez more time to build a new defensive position. So 5,000 Paraguayans take up positions on two ridges, and things couldn't go better for the Paraguayans here. They really couldn't. They're on these very easily defensible ridges. The Alliance is attacking them. This is occurring during a torrential rainstorm, so the Alliance is slowed down terribly. They're attacking these very, very strong defensive positions. It's looking like a win for Paraguay, but then they do something really, really stupid. They launch a counteroffensive. They launch a counterattack. They waste so many of their men. They're outnumbered already. They're in a good defensive position. They come down from those ridges. They launch a counter-attack on the Alliance forces. And predictably, they get absolutely destroyed. The Alliance manages to get up on the ridges with them weakened. And uh, 5,000 Paraguayans end up being captured or killed. The entire army is destroyed fighting this delaying action. So, at this point... Uh, the Battle of Avai actually managed to succeed in keeping a, in buying some time for Lopez to construct a fortified camp. He builds it at Lomas Valentinas. And this is actually a pretty impressive fortification. There's a deep trench works. The camp is up on a hill. It's pretty defensible, but they're just so horribly outnumbered at this point. There are only 3,000 Paraguayans left, and they're surrounded by an alliance army of at least 20,000. And they fight fanatically. Which is what's so, so impressive, and why I say that Lopez really was a very charismatic man. He really, really brought the people of Paraguay together, got them to accept his leadership without question, and even in this hopeless situation, his soldiers, they still fought fanatically. They're outnumbered almost seven to one, and they hold out for five days, six days almost, for this, uh... For this uh, rapidly put together camp, uh, every single one of them, every last man fights for every inch of ground. And 
almost to the last man, they get destroyed. Lopez somehow manages to escape. He's one of less than 100 soldiers who escape when the uh, Alliance finally closes the trap and finally destroys the camp at Lomas Valentinas. So they came so close to ending the war here, they didn't pull it off. Uh, they didn't pull it off. Lopez manages to escape. But... On January 1st, 1869, the Desembrada comes to an end. The Alliance troops enter Asuncion unopposed. The capital has fallen. Um, Cachias, who's getting very old, he's having some health problems. He's completed his masterpiece. One of, the, one of the sources I read referred to it as that. I agree. This was an amazing maneuver. Um, and it completed exactly the uh, objective that he was looking for. So Cachias has completed his masterpiece and he decides to retire as soon as Asuncion falls. So well done Cachias. In my mind, the true military mastermind in this uh, whole situation is Cachias, not Lopez. Lopez is a good general. Cachias is a great general. And uh, this is absolutely his masterpiece. So what's left? The Paraguayans have been absolutely shattered. Lopez is only one of 100 soldiers who escape the uh, the fall of Lomas Valentinas. But, unfortunately, that old malaise sets in again. The Alliance is exhausted. They took a lot of casualties during the Desembrada. They have conquered Asuncion. They need to set up a puppet government there. So they don't pursue Lopez with any great speed. Lopez goes up northeast into the hilly country and he manages to rebuild his army again. 9,000 men and 40 guns flock to his banner. This is uh, mostly the garrison of Asuncion who uh, abandoned the city. Also a lot of previously injured uh, soldiers and a lot of Indian volunteers. The Guarani were actually very very active in this war. Um, so and the, Guar the Guarani, uh, Guarani are the nat native people of Paraguay. Um, they're very active in the war. So he gets a lot of volunteers from the Indians. He gets the garrison of Asuncion. He gets a bunch of men who had been wounded in previous battles. And together, they go and they fight a guerrilla war against the Brazilians. They're basically a gigantic pack of bandits. Hardly anyone even has a gun anymore. They're mostly armed with spears. Um, so... Their primary objective is basically to fight a bandit war. They go around raiding Brazilian camps. The main goal is to steal guns and horses so that they can eventually fight a proper battle again. And this actually goes very well for them. Um, they manage to rebuild their army. They manage to arm everyone, pretty much everyone with a gun again. But eventually, uh, probably around April or May, the Brazilians start pursuing Lopez seriously. They know that until they take down Lopez, the war is not going to end, so they send a large army after him. On August 16th, 1869, uh, probably one of the saddest, <laughs> probably one of the saddest uh, episodes of a very, very sad war at this point takes place. Uh, Lopez sends 3,600 soldiers and 12 guns to fight a delaying action because the Brazilians are getting very close on his trail. So they meet a much larger army at Acosta New. Uh, many of the soldiers in this formation are boys who are aged 12 to 14, and despite it all, they still fight to the last man. If you believe some of the Paraguayan accounts of this uh, battle, which of course are calculated to make the Brazilians seem as evil as possible, a lot of the boys did not want to fight to the last man, but they were still killed regardless. So 3,600 soldiers are either killed or captured. Most of them are boys. Uh, who are not even old enough to have a beard. Um, and August 16th, to this day, is still commemorated in Paraguay as the Day of the Children to remember all of those young men who die at Acosta New, all of the young men who died during the entire war. Uh, because again, Lopez was not choosy. If you could hold a rifle, you were going in the army. Um, so yeah, a very, very, very sad uh, day. Um, Really, everything's just getting kind of sad at this point. But it's really to Lopez's credit that he was so damn charismatic that he manages to keep things together. He manages to keep men in his army to the very bitter end. Well, it's to his credit, but it's also to his detriment because at this point, this is just hubris. It's freaking over, man. It is over. It was over a long time ago. And you are still... You're getting these boys who are like 12 years old killed. 
just so you can continue to fight your war that's it's already been lost for a long time. So it's, you know, a lot of tragedies in history come from a very charismatic person uh, gets in a leader pos leadership position and they just have far too much hubris uh, for their own good. They'll sacrifice anything and anyone to uh, get ahead, to uh, not, uh, not have to admit defeat. Um, it's relevant in today's world as well, but, uh, yeah, this is what's going on here. You have a very charismatic leader who's willing to fight to the last man, and he's actually able to motivate his people to do that, to the last man. But, finally, all bad things have to come to an end. In January 1870, Lopez is down to just 500 followers. He had about 4,000 after Acosta knew, most of them either starved to death or deserted. Uh, he's down to just 500 followers. He makes his final camp at Cerro Cora. And March 1st, 1870, the Brazilians finally find the camp, and they quickly surround it. Uh, they're not letting Lopez get away this time. They want to end it here. So the camp is completely encircled. Nobody is letting Lopez escape. They're taking every measure possible to ensure that the war ends today, and they pull it off. Uh, they beseech Lopez to surrender. He's outnumbered probably 20 to 1 at least at this point. Probably more like 30 or 40 to 1. Um, <laughs> and he refuses. And amazingly, everybody else with Lopez... I mean, if you're with Lopez at this point, you're a fanatic. So I guess it's not that amazing. Every single person with Lopez also fights to the last. Every last one. Uh, Brazil marches in, they attack, they start wiping out the camp and clearing it. Lopez himself is fighting. He gets stabbed by a cavalryman in the chest with a lance. He staggers over to the banks of a nearby stream, but he can't escape to the other side of the stream because the riverbank is too high and he's been stabbed in the chest. So he falls down on the side of the stream and lies there dying. Brazilian soldiers eventually roll up on him. He's still not dead. They recognize who he is, and they once again yell at him, Please, for the love of God, man, surrender. Nope. He shakily, he shakily rises to his feet. He draws his goddamn sword, starts loping towards them as, as fast as he can, which is not very fast at all. He probably can't even walk properly at this point. And he screams at the top of his lungs, Muero con mi patria. I die with my country. And the Brazilians open fire. <laughs> the war, at last, is finally over. Lopez is dead. And he truly does die with his country. Uh, it, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of countries say, a lot of propagandists say, that they are willing to fight a war to the bitter end. That's the whole point of total war. Like, you're going to mobilize the entire resources of your country. You're going to fu use every single last person to do everything they can to defeat your enemy. You're going to do whatever it takes. This is it taken to its logical conclusion well before both of the world wars. This was true total war. This was a fight to the bitter, bitter end. And... The human cost is absolutely staggering. So there's the Lopez status. That's how it ends up for him. We're going to take that away now. And let's move on. So yes, let's uh, discuss that human cost. <laughs> so Paraguay's losses are truly staggering. They were not a large country to begin with. They did not have a large population. Estimates are that between the soldiers who were killed in battle and the civilians who die due to a lack of supplies, lack of food, and disease, 150,000 to 300,000 people are dead out of a pre-war population of roughly 450,000. As much as 70% of the Paraguayan population dies in this war. Uh, it's unprecedented. It, it, it never, never in the modern era has any nation suffered even close to that percentage of people lost in a single conflict. It, it, it it's staggering. It you almost have to laugh about it. Like I, I don't, I don't know how to present this in a way that. Uh, it's just, it's horrible. It's truly, truly, truly horrible. 
Uh, yeah, o up to 70% of the pre-war population of Paraguay is dead after six years of fighting. Truly fought until the bitter end. Uh, casualties for the Alliance are very, very serious as well, but of course not anywhere near as bad as Paraguay. Uh, Brazil lost roughly 50,000 men. Argentina, some estimates say they lost as many as 30,000. That's probably high. It's probably closer to 15 or 20,000. And uh, Uruguay, an even smaller country, loses 5,000 men, which is quite a loss for them. And that includes a lot of their elite Florida battalion, so... Everybody gets out of this very bloodied and very bruised. Um, I don't want to say nobody wins because there were definitely clear winners here, but uh, yes, Lopez sounds like a true baller worthy of Baller Friday. Uh, he's a very, very complex man. He is. It's it's hard to know what to think of him. Uh, on one part, uh, on one hand, you're absolutely in awe, like. He was extremely charismatic. He was he was a decent military mind, and he was determined. He, he was absolutely determined to fight until the bitter end. Uh, he wanted he gave everything for Paraguay, and he made sure that all of his people gave everything for Paraguay as well. So he was he was kind of inspiring in that uh, sense, but at the same time, he's also an absolute monster. <laughs> he's a mad lad. A mad lad is probably a good way to describe Francisco Solano Lopez. Uh, he's a mad lad. Uh, he's, yeah, it's uh, and and you know the debate kind of rages today again uh, among people who are who are familiar with him. Yeah, you either think he's kind of amazing or you think he's kind of awful or. Well, kind of amazing or really awful, probably, is the, are the two camps. Um, and honestly, he's a little bit of both. Uh, yeah, but Lopez is absolutely, absolutely a baller. So, uh, that was the human cost. So, let's kind of go over uh, what happened at the end of the war, now that, we've, uh, now that we've seen the effects, now that we've kind of gone through the war and seen how Paraguay held out that long and the horrific fate that they suffered. Well, how did everyone do? How did they come out in the end? So, Brazil. Brazil, as you might imagine, reaches peak military and political power following the war. They had successfully destroyed a threat to their rule, to their hegemony in, the, in South America. Um, they had reached peak military and political power. They had dominated Argentina and Uruguay into doing their will to achieving their political objectives. Um, so Brazil comes out much like they were as the leading power in South America, and that position is only reinforced, at least at first, by the war. Um, the war also changes Brazil profoundly beyond just the evolution in military tactics the modernization uh, of fighting a fighting a modern war um, it also plays a key role in the slavery debate because a lot of brazilian soldiers are former slaves who earned their freedom fighting in the army and people in brazil see that and that that really provides a very, very powerful point for the abolitionists in the slavery debate, pointing out the heroism of all of these black soldiers who fought for Brazil in this war. So it's very powerful ammunition for the slavery debate in Brazil and probably plays a very important role in abolishing slavery some decades later. Um, it was also a huge triumph for the army. Uh, before, the army was... Uh, the army was not very important in Brazilian political life. It didn't hold a lot of sway. Afterwards, during the war, the army became the most important institution in Brazilian political life, and it held on to a lot of that political power, which is a state of affairs that remains to this day. The Brazilian army is one of the most powerful political institutions in Brazil, even today, and that uh, mostly comes out of their success in the War of the Triple Alliance. However, that uh, that victory that they won, it came back to bite them in the end. Brazil was at peak military and political power immediately following the war, but then the bill came due, and Brazil ran up a truly ruinous amount of debt fighting in the war. It uh, eventually caused a uh, caused a financial crisis, which terribly undermined the rule of Pedro II, led to revolutions, and eventually led to the end of the Brazilian monarchy the end of the Brazilian Empire and the rise of the first Brazilian Republic in 1889. So, like a lot of uh, countries, uh, they won the war, but uh, they kind of destroyed themselves doing so in the long run. Well, 
the country wasn't destroyed, but uh, Pedro's administration surely was. And then, yeah, if you notice on the uh, the picture on the right there, that's uh, the man I circled is the man who shot Lopez. <laughs> Actually, uh, sorry, I take that back. He was the man who stabbed Lopez in the chest with a lance. Um, and that that was a mortal wound. Lopez was going to die of that. Uh, the, the shooting was just kind of a... <laughs> it was a mercy killing more than anything. That's kind of dark, but that's really what it was. But yeah, the guy who was uh, circled there is the one who stabbed Lopez with the lance. And he uh, he generally got credit as the man who killed Lopez, since uh, you know Lopez was actually fighting back at that point, and uh, you know the uh, the guy who shot him just sort of sort of tapped the puck into the net, to use a a, a hockey analogy. <laughs> um, so yeah. So that was Brazil. They uh, they managed to reinforce their position as the leading regional power, but they paid a terrible price to do so. But at least it shaped their society. It uh, shaped the slavery debate, and it, uh, for better or worse, made the army one of the most important uh, figures in Brazilian society. So moving on to Argentina. Victory in the war was very good for Argentina because it allowed the Unitarios to consolidate their power. They had this amazing achievement that they could hang their hats on, and it allowed them to finally, finally achieve a period of internal stability after decades and decades of political chaos. And they used that stability to great effect, uh, especially with all of the central planning going on now in Buenos Aires. They were able to direct their economy very efficiently, and it became one of the largest economies in the world. By the early 20th century, it was always in the top 10 wealthiest countries on Earth, and a lot of years it even had a higher GDP per capita than the United States of America. So by many measures, an even more successful new world country than the United states in the early 20th century however that all kind of turned around in the latter half of the 20th century and it, it has a lot to do with the unitarios because well they centralized the entire country around buenos aires and that created kind of created a crisis uh, eventually of uh, the the countryside is just totally unproductive especially once they got some more uh, more socialist uh leaders, a few dictators like Juan Perón, who were very much into the idea of uh, having a planned economy. They, ha they were entirely centralized around Buenos Aires. The bureaucrats in Buenos Aires had no idea how to manage an economy. Again, there was not really any thought that the uh, countryside is important in managing an economy. So it led in a lot of ways to horrible mismanagement of Argentina's economy. In the early 20th century, it's one of the top 10 wealthiest countries on earth. In the early 21st century, it was having a horrific inflation crisis, and it was in a lot of ways a totally failed economy. And a lot of it has to do with the Unitarios centralizing the entire country around Buenos Aires. Had great returns at first, but it bit them in the ass in the end. But that was what Argentina got out of the war. Uh, nice short-term gains, uh, but set them up for a reckoning in the future. Not too bad. Not too bad, really. Probably. You'd probably take it. Probably take it. I mean, especially uh, since all of the people responsible for the decision were dead when it came back to bite them. Anyways, Uruguay. Ur Uruguay probably changed the least. Um, and that's fair. Uh, I mean, they're... They're the smallest country. They had, they had the least to gain from this war. But uh, yeah, the war, much like Argentina, it allowed the Colorados to consolidate their control over Uruguay, and they ruled the country continuously until 1958, when they were finally, uh, finally overthrown. But unfortunately, Uruguay didn't get that internal stability that Argentina achieved. The Blancos continued to be a problem, and occasionally it flared up into violence. So uh, Uruguay remained in a lot of ways the same as it was, a small, kind of unstable state uh, that fluctuated between, uh, between influence of Brazil and influence of Argentina, although at this point the influence of Brazil was much, much stronger. But the Colorados survived, and they actually survived to the present day. That's that's the, uh, that's the flag of the modern Colorado party. They're not the dominant party in Uruguayan politics anymore. They get about 10% of the vote uh, in most elections, and they're, they're a center-left party in Uruguayan politics even today, the Colorados. So, so, good for them, I guess? But yeah, Uruguay doesn't get much out of the war, really. Um, 
And that's kind of unfortunate because they fought very, very bravely. Um, a lot of the really important, uh, a lot of the really important combat was done by Uruguayan troops. Uh, that discipline they showed on that raid on Tayuti, and uh, yeah, they they fought in a lot of really key places. They had some elite battalions, and they didn't really get much out of the war. It's kind of unfortunate. Anyways, Paraguay. So, at the end of the war, uh, Paraguay cedes just about half of its territory to Brazil and Argentina. Again, Uruguay gets nothing. Um, and the entire country is occupied until 1876. As you might imagine, Paraguay suffers a tremendous social and economic crisis after the war. They have lost as much as 70% of their population, and they are also saddled with war reparations as part of the treaty as well, just adding insult to injury. So for about two generations, Paraguay is an economic uh, non-entity, basically. Um, it takes two generations for them to recover from this war, this absolutely ruinous, ruinous war. Um, after the war, immediately after the war, uh, based on some napkin back of the back of the napkin math uh about four females for every one male in paraguay and this is not adult males mind you this is all males it includes a lot of uh, male children at this point um in some areas where the devastation is particularly bad that number can go as high as 20 to 1 i've even seen a few sources uh arguing 30 to 1 or 40 to 1 so 40 females for every one male remaining and that male is probably not even an adult um, so hope you like Shoda. <laughs> One, however, it's not all bad for Paraguay. It's really not. As hard as that is to believe, it's not all bad for Paraguay because it really brings the country together as a nation. I mean, that's true for like pretty much any, that's true for pretty much anyone, right? You go through absolute hell with someone, you feel close to them afterwards like it brings you together and that was part of the magic of Lopez is that Lopez realizes that the native Guarani people they're absolutely something that the Triple Alliance can use against him they can uh, try and ferment a rebellion among the Guarani people so he reaches out to them instead instead of putting them down like uh, pretty much any European uh country did with their natives at this time, Lopez reaches out to the Guarani and he actually invites them to become part of the cultural mainstream. And as hard as this is to believe, it actually works. The Guarani are receptive and to this day, Guarani culture is an important part of uh, Paraguay's it's an important part of Paraguay's culture. Like 90% of people in Paraguay can speak uh, some Guarani, at least. So. It's kind of a really cool thing that happened as the outcome of a terrible, terrible war, and it was necessary, and again, all credit to Lopez. He, he is, this is probably the most baller thing that he does, is instead of doing what everyone else did and just, you know, brutally suppressing his natives, he actually reaches out to them and he realizes that <laughs> they will be stronger together. I need every possible man on the front line. Don't care if you're a native, don't care if you're white, don't care if you're black, whatever. We need everyone on the front line. We are all in this together. We are all Paraguayans. That is truly the most baller thing that Lopez ever did, is reaching out and incorporating the, the Guarani into Paraguayan culture. It's super cool. Super cool. So that is possibly the only positive outcome. The only positive outcome of the war for Paraguay is that it really brings them together as a nation, really creates the concept of Paraguay as a nation state, both uh, of Hispanic heritage and also of Guarani heritage. So that's very cool, and that's something that something that remains to this day. So definitely, definitely the one really, truly baller thing that Lopez did. So that, I believe, is all I have for you. So that was the War of the Triple Alliance. Uh, just an amazing, amazing story. You know, all of the great, all of the great mythological stories, there's always a fatal flaw in the hero, and it's often hubris. It's often pride. It's believing that you can do a lot more than you can, believing 
believing that uh, you're stronger than you actually are, that you can never fail. Lopez, I think, is so compelling because he falls so neatly into this archetype of the hero who is just full of hubris and ultimately gets destroyed by it. He was an amazing general, not a genius. He made some very, very stupid mistakes, as we saw, but he was a very great military mind, and even more than that, he was an amazingly charismatic leader who truly knew how to run a country. He faced down an army much, much larger than his, three countries, all more powerful than he was. Well, Uruguay, maybe not, but his two very... His two far more powerful neighbors took them six years to conquer his tiny little country of 450,000 people. Um, but in the end, he couldn't accept defeat. It was, as the title said, vencer o morir, either conquer or die. And that was the personal motto of Francisco Solano Lopez, and he lived it. He lived it to the very end. So I think that's part of why he's so fascinating to us. He is a horrible, horrible person for forcing his country to go through that to satisfy his pride. But he's also kind of amazing. He's amazing that he lived up to that standard he set himself of he set set for himself of conquer or die. He's amazing that he brought his country together as a nation state. He's uh, amazing that he kept them fighting even through hellish conditions like that. And uh, he's also amazing because of his military strategies. Like, they didn't work. A lot of times they didn't work, but they were always novel. They were always really exciting. There's some stuff I couldn't talk about in this presentation, like some of the amazing, desperate, desperate uh, stuff he did. All of that is great and all, but I think the real question everyone wants answered is what was the diet like for the average peasant in northern Brazil? Northern Brazil, huh? Um, are we talking on the coast or in the, uh, in the rainforests? Because it's, uh, very different. <laughs> like, the rainforests, uh, it's basically whatever you can get. But, uh, you know, they had some, uh, they had some pretty standard, uh, European diet going on al along the coast. But, uh, yeah, the rainforest got really, uh, rainforests. Lol. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much anything you could get. Uh, a lot of fish. A lot of fish. Obviously, you got a, got a big freaking river to fish in. Um, <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot of uh, agriculture possible. They didn't really start the slashing and burning until later. Uh, so yeah, a lot of fish, probably. <laughs> Actually, uh, th that was uh, one of the big economic effects was the uh, the yerba mate industry, which was a uh, food that was produced by uh, Argentina, Ar Ar Argentina and southern Brazil, and a little bit in Paraguay was uh, absolutely disrupted by this uh, by this conflict, and uh, it had some uh, pretty profound effects on the rest of South America. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the story of the absolute mad lad Francisco Solano Lopez and his uh, little oopsie that killed 70% of his population. So, I hope you enjoyed. i uh, glad you stuck with me. Are there any questions? Anything you'd like to know more about? Uh, I would love to answer some questions. Uh, but yeah, that's all I got for you otherwise. Man. Oh, I'm so... This is such a relief. I'm so glad to be... Uh, <laughs> so glad to be done with this not that i didn't thoroughly enjoy uh putting this together and bringing it to you but uh you know it just took a lot of time and it was kind of weighing on me quite a lot so i'm feeling kind of amazing that i i got this done i got this out here so very happy any questions other than uh the diet and the rainforest <laughs> uh freaking francisco solano lopez are there any slides or pictures you'd like to see again? I can uh, I can go back and uh, pull something up if you'd like to see. <laughs> uh. All right, I think that's looking like a no on the uh, questions. We'll give it another minute or so, but uh, but yeah, South America is South America's wild, man. It really, really is. I think I'd like to do. Um, <laughs> Hell, I might do the Chaco War. I'll do the other big war that Paraguay fought. 
This one actually went a lot better for it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe at some point I'll do the Chaco War. Just can continue with my uh, continue with my Paraguay fanboying. <laughs> or yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of really crazy stuff that goes on in South America that nobody ever talks about. You know what what happens in Rio stays in Rio. You mentioned ironclads, but was their early navy composition mostly just wooden sail? Um, mostly steamers um, at this point. Uh, especially because you're on a river, uh, steamers just make a whole lot more sense. Uh, so yeah, like all of the uh, merchant ships that Paraguay converted were steamers. Their warships were both steamers, and the Brazilian Navy was pretty much all steamers. Uh, some of the steamers were just wooden. Like, if they weren't ironclads, then they were just made of wood. But uh, yeah, they had, uh, they had steam engines. Uh, actually, one of the uh, really interesting things that Paraguay did is they had these things called... Um, Oh my gosh, I forgot the Spanish word for them, but they're basically like little rafts, a little more glorified than a raft. They're they're basically a a small iron or a small wooden boat that has a mortar emplaced on it. So it's basically just like a poor man's monitor. It has no means of self propulsion. They just towed it behind. Uh, they towed it behind their warships, and so they basically had these little cannon platforms that were towed behind their warships. <laughs> um, oh God, I'm gonna have to pull up my. I'm gonna have to pull up my notes here and find the term for it because I've been going for two hours and my mind is uh, empty. Um, ch 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 chata. Chatas. They're called chatas. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was kind of a cool thing that just Paraguay did and it was entirely born out of desperation. It's just, uh, you know, we don't have much of a navy but we can, uh, we can amplify our power very cheaply by just uh, mounting these guns on a wooden boat with no self-propulsion and just kind of towing it behind the other boats. So at least we have some more guns to bring to the fight. They were sitting ducks, obviously, in an actual fight, but uh, for bombarding targets on the shore, made a ton of sense. <laughs> so Chata's, that was their name. But yeah, pretty much all steamers uh, involved in the... Uh, and, and you really would want a steamer for fighting on a, on a river. Like, you don't want to be at the mercy of the wind, especially with the currents going. But yeah, good question, good question. Yeah, I, I didn't go too much into the navies. Um, what else, what else? Yeah, um, <laughs> oh, that reminds me of like, I was mentioning some of the, uh, since I got a little bit of time, I'll, I'll mention some of the other insane things that, uh, that Lopez did in Desperation. So, <clears throat> when, uh, when the ironclads managed to get past Humaita and started bombarding the fortress, Lopez tried to capture the ironclads by sending his men out in canoes. Like, he sent infantrymen paddling out in canoes to try and board the ironclads, and it actually almost freaking worked. Like, they actually boarded, I think, two of the ironclads and started storming them and just barely got repulsed. And it, uh, they were only repulsed because some of the other ironclads got there and their crews jumped onto the ironclads. So yeah, like freaking canoes, man. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, what was the other crazy thing you did? Oh, one of the battles I didn't talk about. Um, so in between, uh, in between uh, that slaughter at Kuripaiti, when the Alliance uh, just totally throws itself against uh, his defenses, he tries to launch another offensive against their camp, and he does so really sneaky. So he goes out in the middle of the night, and he creeps up on their camp, and he actually has all of his men dig three trenches really quick. Um... <laughs> <laughs> like like right in front of the alliance base just out of earshot just out of range for them to see in the dark um he, <laughs> he has them dig three freaking trenches and so they wake up and suddenly here are all these paraguayan soldiers like hanging out in trenches right outside of the camp <laughs> and, <laughs> 
So that's just a moment of panic. And it's a moment of panic for Paraguay too, because they didn't quite finish all of the trenches. So everybody just kind of hunkers down once dawn breaks in what they have, and they just, uh, they slug it out for a couple of hours. And uh, the Alliance actually loses more men than Paraguay, which is uh, rare, rare for uh, the <laughs> rare for the war. But um, yeah, eventually Paraguay retreats because uh, yeah, the trenches aren't finished. And <laughs> that was... It was just, he, he really did fancy himself to be the next Napoleon. And he believed that, you know, if I, if I get cute enough with it, if I, <laughs> if I come up with the perfect strategy, if my men execute it perfectly, there's nothing they can do. I, I am the next Napoleon. I am the greatest tactician in South America. Uh, <laughs> my foes shall quiver before my big meaty brain. <laughs> So yeah, that was another kind of crazy one that almost worked. <laughs> and like, <clears throat> to his credit, Tuyuti almost worked too. Like, uh, if if it had gone according to plan, he had a very good chance of success. Like, if they had actually attacked at dawn and managed to sow uh, confusion among the Alliance's ranks, like, Tuyuti could have been a big-time victory for Paraguay. Charles the Twelfth tier, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So, so yeah, yeah, that's a couple of the, uh, crazier, more desperate ones that, uh, like it didn't, there's not really any point in including them in an, in a broad overview of the conflict, but they're very, cause they didn't make much of a difference, but, uh, they're very, very entertaining. The, the canoes and then the trenches <laughs> and really shows how, how outside the box and how desperate Lopez truly was. <laughs> Also, did you notice on this end slide that the uh, statue is in Montevideo? I don't know why. I, again, Uruguay was on the other side of the war. This would, um, this would kind of be like, uh, you know, France erecting a statue of Kaiser Wilhelm or something. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's there. He's there in Montevideo. I'm really, really unsure why, but, uh, it's a nice statue. <laughs> So yeah, so that is the story of the War of the Triple Alliance, the Paraguayan War. Thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for your questions, Yoshi. Really do appreciate it. Um, I'll be back again tomorrow. Probably going to play some more Coltic, I think. So again, Coltic is that uh, new shooter that came down, came out that really, really is inspired by the old Doom games, and I had so much fun playing it last time. So I'm looking forward to playing that again tomorrow night. So, uh, yeah, I'll probably do that around, uh, probably around 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, tomorrow night. So, hope to see you there. So, until next time, Amiki, I must bid you wale. Thanks so much for coming out. Have a great weekend if I don't see you. And until next time, I'll, uh, I'll see you around. Bye-bye! Don't let the Paraguayans bite.